So good morning. Good morning to everyone on this uh, warm Budapest morning early, but I can see a very large turnout for an exciting subject, number of important speakers here, and it's a great privilege for CEU to co-host this conference with Corvinus uh, in collaboration with partners from across Central Europe. Um, we are proudly at CEU, a Hungarian university, as well as an international university and a U.S. accredited university. And of course, our roots here at CEU run deep in this region. We were founded uh, in this region and with this region very much in mind, and certainly this country, uh, Hungary, very much in mind in 1991. And uh, we have grown, of course, as a university, as many universities have, uh, into an international uh, center of higher education. But I think it's important in the outset of this conference to emphasize CEU's um, Hungarian and Central European roots. We are, after all, the Central European University, not the only Central European University by any means, but uh, we are known as the Central European University. I also want to just very briefly um, pay tribute to my predecessor, Yehuda Elkana, who was a leader of higher education in this region and beyond, and a th thought leader very much in terms of thinking through what universities should be about um, in the 21st century. He spent um, his career at CEU really in the 21st century. He began his rectorship in 1999 and then handed over to me in 2009. And I think uh, Yehuda was really very much at the forefront of this effort to come to terms with the extraordinary changes that are both needed and are being pressed upon universities at this time. I, I think he would probably enjoy an analogy that occurred to me as I was coming here this morning about what really the challenge is for universities today. Um, the challenge is really, let's put it this way, it's like performing open heart surgery on a marathon runner while he's in the middle of the race. And we universities are of course all marathon runners, uh, some longer marathons than others, Universities that I've worked at in the United States have hundreds of years of marathon running. CEU has uh, 25. But there are huge changes that are coming or that we are developing on our own and many, many changes that are being impressed upon us from the outside. Some of them good, some of them dangerous, some of them actually quite negative. So I think, as I understand it, the conference is really exploring all of that, and I felt that the challenges that were listed in the conference program, the various types of challenges, really do define very well what the modern university is all about. And you'll hear much more about this from our keynote speakers, so I'm not gonna speak at all at length, but I just thought I would quickly summarize the three challenge areas that I have seen, from my point of view, from the perspective of someone who has run a university in Central Europe for the last seven years. And, uh, you know, I think first the, the challenge of management and governance um, is very large, particularly for public in institutions, but also for private institutions. Uh, public institutions are facing, of course, diminishing resources, but that's not the whole story. They're also facing increasing government control. Diminishing resources and increasing government control is a re recipe for very, very great pressure on the management and governance structure of those universities. Um, this is having an impact on their mission, um, where perhaps they're <clears throat> having to focus more on productivity and actual delivery of 
real benefits to the society in an immediate and, and, and uh, direct sense, which of course is good, but that has an impact on the more broadly defined educational mission of, of the university. Um, and of course, there's also an impact on academic freedom in this context. Um, certainly the challenges of political influence being brought to bear on universities as government control is exerted more vigorously. Um, that has an impact on the curriculum and it certainly creates a high degree of insecurity among faculty who are trying to exercise academic freedom. So all of these things are management and governance challenges and by the way, they're certainly not, a, not alone felt by public institutions. I just focused on those because I think the pressure is perhaps greatest and most acute. But these issues of, of governance and management affect all of us. Um, private institutions certainly have to um, accommodate or address the overall environment in which in which they're operating from a management perspective and we at we at CEU certainly have understood that over these seven years that I've been president. The second big um, challenge that is indicated in the materials for the conference is the challenge of being relevant to society, societal relevance, which is obviously a social good by definition. The university should be relevant to society. It should be actively a part of the society and very much engaged in all of the issues that the society faces, whether it be trying to develop new forms of health care or security <coughs> developments or human rights or any number of other things. So in a sense, the challenge of societal relevance, I think, is a, is a very positive development creating healthy pressure for more practical and less theoretical education in some contexts. But I think we also have to recognize that there are some downsides of that too, to the extent that it pushes a university be, to be productive in a, in a very immediate sense, in a societal sense, and away from some of the broader educational purposes. I will say here a particular remark about CEU. Um, we every year give a survey to our outgoing students, to our graduates, um, about what they think of the education they've received here. And they generally give the university high marks for the education, the actual learning experience that they've had in the classroom and outside. But the one area that they are somewhat critical of, um, and they feel they haven't received a sufficient amount of training, is in skills, practical skills, skills for management, skills for doing a spreadsheet or for learning how to lead a meeting or whatever other kind of practical skill is inevitably going to be important to a, uh, a graduate of a university, whatever position she or he enters into, whether it's academic or uh, otherwise. So, you know, I think this societal relevance and social skills and uh, practical skills is all generally a positive part of uh, what uh, the current challenges are, but they are di difficult to meet in some cases at the university. Then the third area that I saw is research and development. Um, and of course here we want to find ways of developing a culture of research at universities that um, can in fact contribute to the university's ability to be competitive in the research context. There's a great deal of research funding, European Research Council funding and other funding that's available to those who are doing cutting edge research. So developing that kind of research can be, uh, that kind of culture can, is very important, but it also can be difficult. And it, and it runs into the pressures of, for more productivity and, and more immediate uh, social benefits that I was talking about uh, earlier. So um, here at CEU, our experience is that we need to give the faculty research time, uh, sabbaticals. We need to provide some degree of seed funding, not full funding, but something to get uh, faculty started. 
We need to in stimulate interdisciplinary uh, work among faculty, and we have a new initiative that um, is, I think, proving to be quite successful in doing that, an intellectual themes initiative where we're essentially reorganizing a lot of the intellectual aspects of the university around broad themes that have social relevance um, and bringing faculty together. So anyway, you don't need to hear me any further on this subject, but this is obviously what it is you're going to be hearing from our keynote speakers about. I want to particularly, if I may, welcome uh, Jonathan Cole, who is our board member at CU and a really major leader in the United States on what makes, what can make a great university. And he also works at a great university, Columbia University. So Jonathan, welcome. And uh, he's got a new book, which he will be telling us more about. And I, shall I leave it to our, um, who is the, Livio, the organizer, to introduce our first keynote speaker? Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you very much. And I will now turn it over to the organizers. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I, just one brief note. Uh, Yehuda Elkana was my mentor in 1999-2000 for full year. It was not. It was not an easy relationship. <laughs> and my first paper ever written in 1988 was about uh, Karl Island Popper's Open Society and its Enemies. You know, it was almost 30 years ago. I'm honored and privileged to be able to come back and have a have a, have a talk here. Uh, I've been involved in, in the studies of the academic profession in the, la in the last few years uh, to, a, to a high degree. And that's one of those stories which is probably one, one, of, one, one of the most fascinating at the moment. So uh, let me say a few words about it. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about different classes of academics which emerge today. And I can see it from, from careful studies of, of academic productivity. Uh, there are different people with different working habits, academic attitudes, research outcomes, and the, difference, the differences are bigger than ever before. Or at least I was not aware they are as big today. Uh, by the way, they are as big as 50 years ago. So academics are a unique class in which differences just keep staying over decades. Uh, a brief empirical finding just to give you a gist of what I'm going to, 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 be talk, to, to talk about. 10% of academics provide on average almost half of academic knowledge production or publication. And 5% provide one third, one third. And this, is, this, this result I will talk about in detail in a moment comes from a large scale study of, of 11 European countries. So it's a pretty, pretty, pretty nice story. Uh, I'll be stu studying the issue, who are these highly productive academics uh, and what, increase, what are the factors which increase the odds of entering this class? Who are they? How they work? What they think? What they think about their work, academic work? It's an interesting issue. Are they so much different from the rest of academics or average academics? I would say yes. And there is a number of, 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 of uh, different points I want to, I want to make. So uh, 
what makes some academics substantially, substantially more research productive than others across 11 European systems. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to academic productivity for the proxy of number of journal articles. Easy, crude measure, the number of, of articles. Uh, the issue was explored before in, in, in academic literature, but mostly in national context and most in Anglo-Saxon countries. There were no cross-European or really cross-national studies about the issue. So I'm proud to be talking about uh, top, I call them top performers uh, today. Uh, there's certainly a handful of previous studies focusing on top performers. I'm mentioning just some of them. My goal was to explore the European research elite from a cross-national comparative perspective, first with the data from 11 countries, and through large-scale quantitative material. Most research done in the area was based, was based on, on qualitative material, so dozens or hundreds, hundreds of interviews. I'm using uh, quantitative data. Uh, so the guiding question was, uh, do research top performers across Europe share perhaps similar patterns of working time distribution? The answer is yes. Uh, do they uh, share the same teaching research academic role model, perhaps being highly focused on research? The, the provisional answer was yes. Uh, is there demographic similar, patterns of socialization into academia? internationalizations, etc., etc., a number of factors. I studied a number of factors. The answer is yes, this is a highly unique, unique class of academics. Um, in the nutshell, the question was how different are they from so termed average academics or the rest of academics? Because if you have this 10% uh, academics producing 50% of all publications, there's a clearly divide, top performers and the rest. And I'm talking only about full-time employed academics in the university sector. No part-timers, no non-university sector, just European universities. Uh, so the motivation was, there was a puzzle of the impact of highly productive academics in Central Eastern Europe, in Poland, in the West. I was thinking that perhaps in Poland it's different, or in Central Europe it's different. But as far as, as I know, the data from Slovenia, from Russia, and my Polish data, there's no difference. It's a unique issue, unique divide between top performers and, and, and the rest. So um, my research calls into question the assumption of the relative homogeneity of a European, certainly university-based academic profession. There's no homogeneity. But if you read the studies from the 50s, 60s, 70s, also Jonathan's book, which is, by the way, which is here, and uh, which is one of the most inspiring books in, in academic professional studies from 1973, uh, you see there were always ideas about it. But there was no, no large-scale data, no large-scale data. Uh, so, um, in graphic terms, you can see research performed by, by top performers, by country, in the total national knowledge production. The average is about 45 for all countries, but for mo mo most countries it's about, it's about 50. And uh, an example for Poland, Polish top performers, those 10% produced from 40 in the humanities and social sciences to even 60% of all publications in physics and mathematics. So that's the core of the core, creme de la creme. And uh, the conclusions will be what to do about it, because it's, 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 it's an interesting phenomenon. We all know it and we expect it, but uh, clearly there are data about it. Uh, one word about data and methods, uh, two complementary approaches, statistical interference and the uh, multidimensional logistic regression model. Uh, 17,000 usable cases from across 11 countries. Clean, so two, two subpopulations, the upper 10% of these highly productive academics and the rest, or 90%, all full-time involved on the university sector and all indicating research involvement. There are no teaching, teaching involved people in this, in this data, in this data, data set. Uh, you see the countries here, 11 countries from Austria to the UK. You see the details about cleaning the data, weighting the data, integration, etc., etc. It was all nicely done. It took us six, year, six years to produce this type of clean data set. Uh, I can skip certainly institutional types. I can skip academic fields. 
Uh, and I want to stress just one issue. My approach is a micro level, individual level approach. So I'm relying on primary data. We produce data. Uh, academics said exactly, it was it's self declared. Uh, we studied it across 400, uh, 400 uh, variables. The data were voluntarily provided and they are in a consistent internationally comparable format. So it's time to be working on it. In the era, there are about 15 books at the moment, thick books from, from across, across the world. But, but this story of, of mm, high performers is, I would say, is unique. Uh, so the individual academic is the unit of analysis. Uh, I'm coming back uh, just for, for, for 30 seconds to the quality quantity dilemma, which was certainly uh, discussed by Jonathan and his brother, let me quote it. Um, Since quality and quantity of research output are fairly highly correlated, the high producers tend to publish the more consequential research. Engaging in a lot of research is in one sense necessary condition for the production of high quality work. So my assumption is simple here. More productive academics produce more articles and less productive academics produce fewer articles. It's crude, but, and, but it's simple. Uh, for 20 seconds, the sample in general, you can see 17,000 academics, 13,000 13, research involved, and finally 1,500 top performers, this upper 10% based on, based on the research productivity per clusters of academic fields, certainly. So it was first cluster divided by academic fields and then uh, added. Um, so what, I, what I'm presenting here is new evidence found for an old thesis. We just knew it. Look again at coal and coal. Sorry. Uh, only a small proportion of scientists produce the bulk of, uh, bulk of science which emerges from the scientific community four decades ago. Uh, and uh, three decades ago, no matter how it's measured, there is enormous inequality in scientists' research productivity etc etc we just knew it we didn't know it about european countries we knew it from anglo-saxon countries certainly we didn't know it about poland for poland it's exactly 50 percent we are just any other other western european country which is somehow surprising um, let me skip this and and pass on to bivariate analysis. I was interested in academic attitudes and academic behaviors, what academics think about their work and how they work in terms of, of uh, working time distribution. Are they really different top performers from the, the rest of academics? Uh, that was my question. I explored it through five dimensions of academic work. Uh, teaching, research, service, administration, and other spend hours spent per week and I, ex I explored four academic roles. If you ask, we ask the academics, what's your primary, what's your, uh, are you primarily involved in teaching, primarily, sorry, uh, primarily interested in teaching, primarily interested in research, or in both, but leaning towards teaching or leaning towards research. So I have four, four academic roles and five dimensions of academic work. And uh, as you can see here, um, I performed t-tests for the equality of means for top performers and the rest of academics asking and thinking about the question how long do you spend on various academic activities and the answers in general are then when the mean for top performers is substantially and statistically significantly higher top is in the, in the column. As you can see, top performers are everywhere. They spend not only more total time every week, but also other time, administration time, service time, and research time. So top performers just m work much, much longer hour, week by week, m month by month. And when I asked about uh, role, uh, academic role, the question was, uh, Again, primarily in teaching and interest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see here that top performers are in the lower two, lower two lines, t uh, leaning towards research and primarily research. I made enormously, enormously detailed analysis per country and then per academic discipline. But the answer is always is always the same. Top performers are never or almost never primarily involved in teaching or in both, but, but, but leaning towards teaching. 
Uh, so, to summarize it somehow, working patterns of top performers are similar across all 11 systems I studied. Their, le their level of research orientation is similar, they are just more research oriented. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, total working time is like um, 62, 65 more days annually in Germany or in Norway, or 50 days in Poland. They work 50 to 60 days more annually, eight hours a day. And, they, and maybe that's one of the reasons, yeah? That I'm presenting predictors of entering this class. Uh, they are top performers. And, um, but uh, surprisingly, they spend not more time not only on research, but on all, all, all categories, all major activities, uh, sometimes even including teaching in some countries. They just work, on average, much longer hours, week by week, month by month, possibly year by year. Um, and uh, just one slide coming back to conclusion somehow, logistic regression analysis. What does it say, the, the answer? In a word, European research top performers emerge as, first, much more cosmopolitan much more internationally, internationally oriented in research, definitely. So the power of internationalization research is, is, is emphasized here. They are much more hardworking. The power of long overall working hours and long research hours. We just know it. You can't work short hours, statistically speaking, and, and be top performer. It's just hours and hours. Many other factors also, certainly. And uh, finally, much more research, or much higher research orientation. So there's a power of single academic focus uh, compared to the rest of European academics. And I would stress here, despite differentiated national context. So we were, I was studying Anglo-Saxon countries. I was studying continental systems, Humboldtian systems, um, southern, southern European systems. But the, the pattern is exactly the same for, for top performers. And the results from this logistical regression analysis just, just confirm it. Uh, Conclusions. I called it the 10-50 rule. It's not even 20-80, as in Pareto, it's 10-50. So uh, it, it is a corroboration of the systematic inequality in knowledge production suggested by great predecessor Alfred Lotka, during the Solar Prize, certainly the cause. The cause. I term it the 10-50 rule. It holds strongly across Europe. This European top performers, they are a highly homogeneous group of academics. Their high research performance is driven by structurally similar factors, and factors are individually related. They, they are individual, they are not institutional. So it's very hard to replicate them. The, these are individuals, not individuals in, in institutional context. So from whichever institutional context they come, they work first according to similar working patterns, long, long hours, research and long total hours, etc., etc., And they share similar academic attitudes, research, research, research. Uh, they are similar from a European cross-national perspective, but they differ substantially uh, internationally from their lower performing colleagues. So this unique class is similar across Europe and it's much more different from their colleagues well, internationally. That's one of the, one of the findings. So I, I call them a universal academic species with roughly the same burden of academic knowledge production. It brings us to policy dilemmas, and that's, that's almost, almost the end of the story. Uh, what, what should we do as countries? Should we, should we be supporting high-performing individuals or should we be supporting institutions with those individuals or um, thinking about the concentration of talents in some places? It's a big issue in Poland. We have two top universities, Krakow and, and Warsaw, and, and it's an issue. Should we support uh, research across Poland in, say, 50 top institutions or just in two and make people move? So the, the question is, should top performers move? Is it difficult to be working in unfavorable, unfavorable institutional cultures or in the minor league universities with high performing research? It is very difficult. So the answer is probably, probably movements are, are necessary. Um, there are also the disadvantages of this concentration of research, certainly. Think, think just about this. Uh, what happens if, if they move out of country or out of Europe? or out of the academic profession. Immediately, academic produ production is huffed 
just halved. So it's a big issue because our, uni our European universities are heavily reliant on them. Any reform agenda, and I'm right now responsible for the, the new agenda of Polish reforms starting ne this week, next week. Uh, the, the, the overall approach might be, please don't harm, don't harm, primum non nocere, uh, this uh, unique, unique, unique class of academics. It's one of the answers. You can also push them to work even harder, but they will say, no, it's impossible to work harder or longer or be more productive. It's just impossible, and we know it from the statistical data. So, uh, uh, last sentence is, uh, um, top performers can drive change in all our countries. In Poland, they do. In Western Europe, they don't. But certainly in, in post-communist countries, they can drive change. But they can also stop it. They are in, in, in good positions to stop or redirect changes. Because they are role models in most, question, in, in, in most, in most uh, uh, con national contexts. They're a natural reference community for academics. People look at them. So they are important. So, um, especially in Central Eastern Europe, with a short tradition of high performers, it's a highly, highly fragile class of academics. It's only 10% of people, but their in influence is high. There are haves today, haves, and there are many not haves today. So, so they need to be taken into account wherever structural reforms are being introduced. And this is the, the final policy conclusions from, from the story. It's certainly much more detailed, but I skipped many, many slides to leave some time maybe for, for, for a discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.